without much ado, I'd like to call upon the first participant. We have Dr. Ashwini Manik Purudev, Assistant Professor in English from AKI's Pune College of Arts, who's going to present first. Do we have uh, Dr. Ashwini here with us? Yes, ma'am. Yes. All right. Okay, ma'am. Uh, so you are going to speak on politics and women in Nantara Sagal's rich like us. Yes, ma'am. Over to you, ma'am. Can I start? Look forward, look forward to listening to you. Yes, ma'am. Please go ahead. Okay. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm going to present a paper on politics and women in Nantara Sagal's rich like us. Now, uh, before I start with it, I would like to put up a few things in the background. Uh, Nantara Segal, we all know, is the cousin of Mrs. Indira Gandhi. So it is said that she presents an insider's view approach towards emergency. Now, this novel has uh, received two prestigious awards, the Sinclair Prize for Fiction and the prestigious Sahitya Academy Award. Now, Nantara Segal herself says that, you know, politics is embedded in her, I quote, bones and marrows, and in her, uh, quote, emotional and intellectual makeup, unquote. So she cannot be a passive witness to the events having effects on human interests. Now, Rich Like Us is set in 1975. It fearlessly presents an account of the harassment caused to people during emergency. While writing about the dictatorship during emergency, Nayantara Segal is criticizing the beginning of the capitalist turn in Mrs. Indira Gandhi's policies and her abusive behavior in 1975 to 77. That's regarding censorship, imprisonment of political leaders, and massive sterilization campaigns. Now, if we look at the reasons why the emergency was declared, that was on 12 June 1975, when Justice Jagmohan Lal Sinha of the Allahabad High Court found the Prime Minister guilty. It's Raj Narayan who had been defeated in parliamentary election by Mrs. Gandhi. Uh, he, there were you know, successive cases of election fraud and use of state machinery for election purposes by her. The court declared her election null and void and unseated her from the Lok Sabha. This conviction prevented Mrs. Gandhi of running for or holding any elective office for a period of six years. The result of all this was the strikes in labor and trade unions, student uh, unions and government unions had swept across the country. Protests led by J.P. Narayan that is Jai Prakash Narayan, Raj Narayan, Satyendra Narayan Sinha and Murarji Desai flooded the streets of Delhi close to the parliament and the prime minister's residence. Now this emergency period, it started overnight. Politicians and newspapers, they demanded resignation of Mrs. Gandhi and organized a huge demonstration against her on 25th June 1975. On 26th June, Mrs. Gandhi's allied force arrested the political leaders of the opposition Hours later, she proclaimed the state of national emergency, which included the suspension of basic civil rights and tight censorship over press. Now, with this backdrop in the novel, Sonali is an IS officer who has grown up in an idealistic world. She is unable to accommodate herself to the new requirements of the emergency. She rejects the application for the setting up of the imported Hapiola uh, drink factory by Dave and Newman, which was supported by the Minister of Industry purely on economic grounds. Sonali is demoted, demoted and she is unable uh, to cope up with the situation and hence is transferred out of Delhi. She is unable to discard the values she inherited. We find through Sonali that the civil servants knew it was no emergency, but no one dares to protest. And if one protests, one gets punished like Sonali. She suffers multiply as she gets harassed as a bureaucrat, as a woman and as a common citizen. She is an empowered woman who has the courage to refuse favors even in the light of darkening emergency regime. Now, this was about one woman in the novel. The another woman, that is Nishi, she belongs to the lower middle class and is a child of the partition. She accepts the lies of emergency for personal benefit but is betrayed by it in her father's arrests. Her zeal to support emergency is motivated by self interest and greed. This shows the apathy of the ruling classes and their willingness to ruin the nation for personal gains. She takes an active interest in sterilization program, bundling every man in the household into the van that would take them to the vasectomy camp. Through her, Seigel has shown how a strong-willed woman's love for her family could make her a pathetic supporter of an unjust social and political system. 
she herself does not take a stand that may go against the times she even studiously avoids talking about politics she too has empowered herself with the weapon of emergency for a self interesting cause and not for ideal purpose like sonali so there is a big contrast between both the women india becomes dominated now by diseases poverty injustice oppression religious superstitions communalism casteism bigamy sati rape torture violation of civil rights corrupt politicians and bureaucrats greedy and callous socialites exploitative ruling classes crushed and defeated masses now the emergency is very graphically painted with trade unions being crushed news blacked out bureaucracy politicized delegations of teachers lawyers school children entrepreneurs and others passed through the motions of praising the leader for timely wisdom there are also women uh, there, there are also woven into the narrative factual bits like the blinding of criminals and the raid on jawaharlal nehru university but the novel is very rich in political parallels the madam in the novel who has brought in the emergency is mrs gandhi and the son who rules who uses the official power to produce a small car project is sanjay gandhi the novel records the developments historically set in motion by them the uh, the family planning and our afforestation drives the move for japanese collaboration in the small car project etc however the novel also includes a number of things attributed to nepotism attempts to foster family rule prime minister's designs to make herself president and to bring her son to power violation of all norms in making the prime minister's son an entrepreneur overnight government arranged rallies to appreciate the emergency are also seen jay prakash narayan's arrest for his anti government activities under emergency provisions and his deteriorating health are historically confirmable facts and they are depicted in the novel now the novel seems to focus on sonali's growing understanding that her ideals in a free india all people are equal have fundamental human rights and all have access to an unbiased judicial system have little basis in the reality of 1970s as india sonali realizes that indian nationalism has not liberated all of india's people now the narrative is also full of reminders of injustices and violences done to indian citizens in their own nation now the story of the emperor's new clothes perfectly fits it to the politics and the emergency in the novel there are two references in the novel where the clever weavers dupe emperor into giving them gold to weave the, him a suit of golden clothes though no one is able to see the clothes everyone decides to keep quiet and continue with the pretense of seeing what in fact does not exist now these references occur at different places sonali thinks of this parallel right at the beginning of the novel i quote from the novel we were all taking part in a thinly disguised masquerade preparing the stage for family rule and we were involved in a conspiracy of silence which is why we are we were careful not to do more than say hello when we passed each other in the building and not to talk about our work after us which made after our sessions very silent indeed no one wanted trouble as long as it didn't touch us we played along pretending the empress's new clothes were beautiful to put it charitably we were being realistic we knew we were up again power we couldn't handle individually or collectively another lady in the novel rose i quote her she is also talking about the emperor's new clothes sounds i quote sounds like the emperor's new clothes to me said rose first of all there is no car and then you nationalize the one there isn't and in these years what you are saying is there isn't even a model unquote now sonali speaks about the attitude of the civil services towards emergency we knew this is no emergency if it had been priority the priorities would have been quite different we were all taking part in a thinly disguised masquerade preparing the stage for family rule unquote now emergency was turning dictatorial when where history was were being revised people were afraid of confronting a power they didn't know how to handle the intellectuals were silent to protect their positions 
of privilege and betrayed india segal refers to them as professors lawyers doctors editors their names are unimportant as almost entire class had collaborated with the government to play with democracy censorship immobilized the press and covered the country with stillness for nobody knew what was going on criticism oral or written of the government was forbidden radio and television were censored and used to promote herself and her party and twist happenings in india a single news agency samachar fed the press with official handouts editors were thrown out of their jobs and replaced by flatterers censorship had been most highly effective instrument during emergency keeping people ignorant about an event in another town or even half a mile away from their own town several jail breaks major news items in ordinary times were not permitted to be reported at all news it traveled through grapevine more than 5 people could not assemble without special permission permission was freely given to spontaneous demonstrations in support of the prime minister now nayantara segal has very realistically portrayed emergency and the cult of family rule casteism elitism black money and various immoral practices without exaggeration she brings out the implications of the events like nationalization of banks private car manufacturing and physical physical drink collaborations the elite hijackers is club vasectomy cl- slum clearance youth camps over zealous chief ministers and policemen enforcing emergency committed judiciary etc she uses symbols images irony paradox and humor to highlight emergency now the emergency is a deadening world of censorship and newsless newspaper now sonali is very much taken aback by the situation i quote her what a bare month of censorship can do exactly the opposite of what i would have expected of a news blackout why you don't have you stop missing for after a while unquot she is stunned by what is happening around her and fails to react in any way she had been humiliated it was as if the whole nation had surrendered politics had surpassed morality there is no distinction between good and evil or between right and wrong everything is determined by the side you are on the question which is repeatedly asked over and over again during emergency is what has gone wrong several answers come men are cowards economic divisions are one and the upper classes have betrayed the country and the civil services have succumbed to political pressures segal explores the different aspects of the political structure which like an octopus has spread its tentacles everywhere in family relationships business concerns idealism or friendship to conclude the novel offers no easy solutions to mankind's problems on the contrary it challenges all known solutions just as there are no solutions there is no one to blame in the story of the emperor and his new clothes one doesn't really know whether the emperor the weavers or the people are to be blamed reality is avoided by all of them of course nayantara segal criticizes mrs gandhi and leaves the reader wondering if india is getting into a sort of a colonialized state exploited for the advantage of a few now, as a form of resistance she promotes individual responsibility in asserting indian independence which applies to mrs gandhi as well not everything is bad sonali resigns from her jobs and takes up historical studies to find solace and identity the novel ends on an ambiguous note of optimism reminding sonali that she is young and alive with her own century stretched out before her waiting to be lived now such an approach to the past and present highlights the fact that the spirit of india is too powerful to be overwhelmed by trials like emergency and it will arise like phoenix to discover its richness and legacy thank you i am done with my presentation i thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity to present myself thank you thank you dr ashwini
uh, we uh, take up questions uh, based on what you have presented at the end once all the speakers are through and uh, of course the presentation was excellent you could you know bring before our eyes the emergency situation and the uh, plight of the characters at that point of time yes a beautiful novel written by nantara sadar so we'd love to have a discussion with you at the end of the session thank, thank you, you. Now, uh, may I call upon the second speaker of the day, uh, Dr. Anita Goswami, Assistant Professor, Department of English, uh, IEC University, Madhya Pradesh, and Poonam Sharma, her research scholar from the same university. And uh, the topic for their presentation is diaspora literature, its impact and consequences on Indian English literature. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah. Am I audible, ma'am? Yes, ma'am, you are. You may please go ahead. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Poonam ma'am, are you trying to share your screen? Ah, uh, yes, ma'am. I'm trying, but it is not sharing. Okay, so you can try uh, again, or we'll we'll be happy to listen to you otherwise as well. Ah, uh, okay, ma'am. You may try again, please, once. Good afternoon to all of you. First of all, I would like to thank, uh, give a lot of thanks to the organizer and convener of this international conference on Commonwealth, the teacher, who has given a uh, very good platform for us to present our paper. Uh, it is my second time to present a paper uh, in this series. So my topic is diaspora literature, its impact and consequence on Indian English literature. As we have heard a lot of our the word diaspora from everyone. who had already uh, told me us about diaspora so i will not uh, take a long time about this so i am uh, starting with my topic diaspora literature involves an idea of homeland a place from where the displa displacement occurs and narratives of harsh journeys undertaken on account of economic compulsion the south asian literature is also known as diasporic literature in which identity crisis nostalgia rootlessness hybridity in betweenness and sense of belongingness are the common features basically in south asian literature most of the writers have shared their own traumatic experiences uh, their homelessness or their forefathers traumatic experiences of colonialism in south asian literature is like an ocean in which vast and multiple diasporic experiences are floating in the form of poetry novels articles uh, prose writings and memoirs so in this series i am also uh, keeping it next point which is my topic indian uh, impact of diaspora literature on indian english literature the indian diaspora is largest diaspora in the world with its global presence and a history date uh, that dates back to the indian civilization the indian diaspora can be divided into three phases uh, Uh, that are ancient medieval and modern the asian diaspora refers to the laborers craftsmen traders who explored new lands for the works wealth and adventures or in the medieval times the british imperialism caused movement of indentured laborers or in the modern times as uh, we are here the skilled and educated or intelligent indians moved to usa or another european countries for their economic or professional reason so we can say that indian diaspora plays a very important role for uh, diasporic literature so i am starting with my uh, uh, with my presentation with my first poet usha kishore usha kishore understand and writes about the interior and exterior of immigrants mind which oscillate between belonging and alienation she deals with the concept of post colonialism while showcasing the scuffle between host and immigrant Usha Kishore as an Indian born British poet 
is representative of south asian migrants who have made bigger leap in the continent's culture and languages uh, in her poem journeying into a foreign tongue usha kishor accentuates that learning a foreign tongue is like programming oneself to something alien acceptance of foreign culture comes at the sacrifice of one's own roots when he became enters a foreign culture he or she adopt the foreign attire to look like native of the host country in her poem you and me usha kishore writes about her experience and observation as an immigrant in britain she attempts to soothe the bond between people of the host culture and post colonial immigrants she uh, you refers to the people of the host culture who discriminate the show racism towards the immigrants or me refers to the post colonial immigrants who experience a strong feeling of duality being an indian and then being an british usha kishore highlights that the books prescribed in the uh, uh, british curriculum teach about the universal universal brotherhood but as a professor she also teaches the british students about the ideology ideologies of uh, uh, writers like uh, maya anglo ctb biko who have resisted racism the poem present hope and optimism that in case the intermingling and assimilation of different culture occur a change can be observed kishore is optimistic that people of the two different continents may admire and approve of each other's culture heritage attire and custom so in this next series my next poet uma parmeshwaran parmeshwaran's writing comprises of different genres which include short stories plays and poems with these common themes which juxtaposes her western experiences with the indian or uh, indian realities in her play named dear didi my sister she discusses the lives and experience of indian immigrants as they struggle hard to adjust and cope up with the new atmosphere of the new land in order to survive in an uh, alien place a school boy named ailago from philippines asked his mother to change his name to the uh, to jim or david because he think that he is uh, he is not able to adjust himself to the uh, another place uh, so with these lines he said ma may you think could change my name to jim or david something it would be nice to be white more like everyone else you know that he want to present himself to uh, show himself to be a british or a, a english person uh, in my next work meena alexander is essentially a poet of countryside and she reveals sincerity and intense concern for the plight of expatriate and immigrant who prefers to st- uh, settle in the another countries for some reason meena is a genuine diasporic voice expressing her own life life diasporic experience in her poems uprooting and exile alienation and identity migrant memories and traumas separation and loneliness are the way for india to sudan and usa she cherishes Mary Elizabeth but she has been called Mina since her birth and in her teenage she officially changed her name from Mary Mary to Mina means she want to adjust herself in the foreign land but does not want to change uh, do not want to does not want to change her name for this purpose or she has uh, her poetry has been widely published as in new york times magazine with the name of Mina Alexander so in this series uh, i want to just want to share with the works of uh, bhakti mukherjee uh, who has uh, tried to show very uh, very much knowledge very much her experience of uh, her being a diasporic literarist bhakti mukherjee is an american novelist born in india her life show her stronger resemblance to the characters of her fictional world it is the voice of bharti mukherjee who speaks behind all the protagonist of her novels she is quite sensible writer basically the literary tendency were reflected in her early childhood but still in the formation of writer some major impact of sensibility are also responsible the her early two novels the tiger's daughter and by are focusing on the theme crisis of belongingness both uh, both the novels the tiger's daughter and in the by is based on the biographical experience of bharti mukherjee uh, she narrates the story of young bengali girl tara born in calcutta return her native land after 7 year of time 
एंड आफ्टर हर मैरिज शी मैरिड इन अमेरिका हर मैरिज आउट कास्ट टू टू एन अमेरिकन नो शी इज अनेबल टू को रिलेट विद हर फादर अबाउट हर मैरिज बिकॉज शी इज ऑलरेडी रूटलेस इज फ्रॉम हर ऑन कंट्री एंड देन शी अगेन मैरिज टू अनदर आउट कास्ट पर्सन सो इट वॉज वेरी डिफिकल्ट फॉर हर टू बैलेंस्ड विद हर पेरेंट्स एंड बैलेंस्ड विद हर कल्चर बैलेंस्ड विद हर ट्रेडिशन हर फैमिली मेंबर्स एंड हर फ्रेंड्स शी फील हर सेल्फ रूटलेस हर पोजिशन इज लाइक थ्री शंकु she is bewildering between native land and adopted land uprooted from her native culture and identity she has also lost the sense of belongingness she lives like uh, she lives her life like uh, like an exile she suffers the trauma of identity uh, her own identity uh, for the search of her new identity in the new place uh, in which she was unable to adjust herself according to new condition so in the end to conclude i uh, i can say that these works marked by the sense of loss uh, means the historic literature works are the works which are marked by the sense of loss the pair of exile and dislocation diaspora literature is the literature of the migrants expressing their experiences and sense of displacement and loss of social contexts like nation ethnicity race culture language etc their identity crisis sense of alienation nostalgia loss and emptiness they experience social isolation culture culture shock and stress therefore in diasporic literature we come across the theme of emptiness frustration disillusionment homesickness racism and discrimination uh thank you very much actually my laptop was not working well so i i'm presenting my uh, paper presentation through my mobile phone thank you that's not a problem ma'am thank you thank you so much for the interesting presentation and uh, uh, the writers you chose the poet poetess poetesses and the uh, novelists of course they have done a remarkable work in their own fields so we'll uh, take up a discussion at the end once everybody is through hopefully the house will have a lot of questions to ask now we move on to our next speaker for the day hadia chishti research scholar uh, from baba gulam shah badshah university rajouri jammu and kashmir do we have hadia chishti With us. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, okay. ma'am. Good evening. Good evening. Your topic is wounds of the Irish Troubles, past and present. Over yes, ma'am. Over to you, Hari. You may please begin. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Is my screen visible? Not yet. Is it visible now? It should be. Yeah, now I can see it. Okay. Okay. So my topic is wounds of the Irish Troubles, past and present. So uh, let's begin then. First of all, I would like to give a historic historical perspective, uh, as we ha might have read. we might have read in uh, uh literature also uh, we uh, the irish troubles also called the northern irish conflict it was an ethnic nationalist conflict that lasted for a period of 30 years from 1960s up to the good friday agreement of 1998 it was not a religious problem it was a political issue it was about the constitutional status of northern ireland like we might have studied in history that uh, the southern ireland uh, which was part of uh, the northern ireland that it had it was under the control of british british government but it got independence back in the 1920s so the northern ireland was still under the control of uh, britain gov british government now the problem was that uh, we have two communities in northern ireland uh, catholics and the uh, protestants so catholics were mostly they were uh, the nationalists the republicans they wanted northern ireland to merge with the southern ireland the mainland ireland and uh, the 
protestants they were uh, predominantly loyalists or the unionists they were loyal to the british crown they wanted northern ireland to remain under the control of british government so these two communities and these two parties uh, we can say they had their armed paramilitary wings also for example if we talk about the republicans or the nationalists their paramilitary wing was irish republican army or what we simply call ira ira eventually got split up into different groups because of varied uh, political national interests Similarly, if we talk about the national, uh, the loyalists and the unionists, they also had their paramilitary wings, like Ulster, Ulster Defence Association, and other different forces. So statistics show that uh, around 3,500 people were killed in the conflict, uh, whereby we have 32% civilians, 32% British forces, and 16% members of paramilitary groups. So the varied political interest uh, kind of pitted the th these two communities against one another, eventually uh, giving way to the cycle of violence and bloodshed. This period is defined by violence, bloodshed. It's also punctuated by frequent bombings, rioting, extrajudicial killings, attacks on police parties, or we can also say that uh, these army crackdowns. But uh, this, uh, the troubles, they almost lasted for a period of 30 years. Uh, uh, and then in the year 1998, this agreement was signed between British government, Northern Irish government, and other uh, political parties that were there. And uh, studies show that, studies say, and people usually believe, the scholars and the historians, that this marked the end of uh, the conflict. This agreement was very important because it paved way for a peace process where it was decided that the future of Northern Ireland would be decided by uh, both the parties. Together, the power would be shared by the local parties. Uh, they talked about issues of sovereignty. They talked about issues of uh, cultural rights, social rights, uh, the demilitar demilitarization, decommissioning of weapons, and all other things. Uh, after the Good Friday Agreement of 1998, different agreements were also signed from time to time, like we have St. Andrew's Agreement of 2006, where, where they talked about the devolution of power. So devolution in this context means that the United Kingdom uh, kind of transferred a wide range of political powers to the local uh, MPs and ministers of Northern Ireland. They were supposed to decide the future of uh, Northern Ireland. Then also we had different um, agreements and different operations for example uh, in the year 2007 we had the operation banner where the british government withdrew its forces from the northern island so these are some of the developments which i briefly talked about to give this historical perspective moving on to the present the present scenario in the northern island uh, most of the good friday agreement has been implemented so far um, uh, but when you talk about the ground level, the ground situation, uh, we have still the paramilitary forces out there because uh, there is still the potential for violence. People are still divided by their ideologies. After the troubles, there were these peace walls or what we call peace lines. Uh, they were set up by the government to segregate these two communities. So these peace walls or peace lines are still there. There was a research, a study was conducted in the year 2012, if I'm not wrong, uh, where it was found that around 69% of the Irish population, they were favor of, uh, in favor of these peace lines and peace walls. Again, that they were uh, afraid maybe things might get out of hand, history might repeat itself. So it's better to keep these two communities separated. But what kind of worsened the situation again was the Brexit. Uh, it disturbed the power imbalance in Northern Ireland. Uh, but particularly the protesting community in the Northern Ireland, they felt betrayed, they felt disenfranchised because uh, after Britain's exit from the European Union, they felt that uh, it would kind of impede uh, uh, the free flow of goods across the borders, it would impede the movement of people, uh, and it also kind of uh, implement the customary checks uh, across the borders. So which kind of... Uh, uh, again, made the situation volatile. Uh, several incidents of violence were reported in Northern Ireland in the year 2020. So again, so we can see that divisions are still there. Uh, we don't see violence uh, uh, explicitly, but divisions are there because a large section of society still dreams about uh, the unification, of Northern, uh, unification with the mainland Ireland. So maybe things might uh, get out of hand if the political balance is not, uh, uh, if the political power uh, does not, uh, uh, is not kept in check, or if the power, if the uh, political parties are not able to handle the situation. 
So let's look at the literary perspective, how writers uh, in fictional and non-fictional works have kind of portrayed the troubles. So writers across different genres, be, be it uh, dramas or novels, short story writers, fictional, non-fictional narratives, they have kind of uh, presented a very naked portrayal of the troubles. We have different uh, and dimensions of the conflict that have been presented to us. We have some uh, uh, Catholic-centric narratives, some Protestant-centric narratives, all talking about the excesses done by the other community. Even if we talk about the post troubles literature, some even talk about the agreements, the successes and failures of the agreements signed uh, from time to time. And uh, different writers have uh, uh, been awarded different prizes. They have achieved fame and recognition for talking about the Irish troubles. You might have heard about Anna Burns, who won uh, the Booker Prize in 2018 for a novel Milkman, where she again is seen talking about the claustrophobic uh, atmosphere of uh, the troubles and how these different characters suffer in different ways. So we have some very famous names, like we have Deirdre Madden, Anna Byrne, Seamus Heaney, Brian Fryle, Bernard McLeverty, Glenn Patterson, who have contributed a lot to the Troubles literature. Now, what do we find common in all these works is that if there is violence and bloodshed that engulf each and everybody, respective class, age, or gender. Even if we talk about the research work, uh, research papers and non-fictional works, what they're trying to do is they try to deconstruct these notions of victimhood, survival and resilience, because in such a complex atmosphere, it really becomes difficult to categorize people, to identify who is a real victim, who is a real sufferer, because each and every person is suffering in different ways, right? So it becomes really different to kind of identify the people even uh, be it, uh, be it uh, among the Catholics or the Protestants. And even the people who are there living in Northern Ireland who have survived the conflict, in these particular fictional narratives or non-fictional narratives, we find them, they are battling with these identity crises. And there are these PTSDs, post-traumatic stress disorders that are there. So uh, you also find disillusionment and disbelief. Uh, people are questioning each and everything. Uh, Again, these works show that how, uh, you know, in back in 1960s and 70s, how rumor mongering and how these um, sus uh, uh, suspicions, how kind of uh, impact, how these things impacted the people, how these uh, things pitted the communities against one another. You will find characters that question each and everything. There's loss of faith in system, judicial system, religious system, all the institutions that kind of keep a society together. Uh, so you will find the issues of alienation, you will find anxiety, trauma. That is what writers are trying to bring forth uh, in their narratives. I would like to uh, give you a textual perspective also through some examples. I, I would like to briefly talk about some texts uh, because it's actually I'm working on uh, these texts. This, it's part of my dissertation, so I'll briefly talk about it. Uh, if we talk about this writer, Deirdre Madden, in her particular novel, One by in the Darkness, what Madden is trying to do is she's trying to talk about the individual struggles. Uh, in this particular novel, briefly, I would like to talk about it. We have this particular family, Quinn family, and the head of the family, Charlie Quinn, he gets killed because he's at the wrong place and at the wrong time. He's not the actual target, but unfortunately, he gets killed. So this is in, uh, his death, how his death impacts the lives of the family members is what Madden is trying to do, how they, one by one, how they suffer in the darkness. That's what Madden is trying to do. This is one of the examples. Similarly, in another important novel, Hidden Symptoms, she focuses on this particular character, Teresa Cassidy. Teresa is uh, totally disillusioned because she has lost her twin brother Francis to the sectarian violence. Now, why Francis gets killed? Francis does not have direct uh, connection with the turmoil. He's killed because he's a Catholic. So he's innocent, but he's killed because of his faith. Uh, similarly, we have a very important uh, work uh, titled as Say Nothing, A True Story of Murder and Memory in Northern Ireland. Uh, it's a journalistic study. It's actually a true story. It was based on this lady, namely Jean uh, McConwell, who was a widow. Uh, a 30 year old widow who had 10, ten children. Now, this Jean McConwell was uh, arrested. She was kind of, she was kidnapped by Irish Republican Army because they suspected her to be a spy. 
working against them. So, so what happens to her children is horrendous. That's what uh, Keith is trying to present here, uh, that how these families, how these families suffer, how their members suffer, how the society uh, in totality is engulfed by this turmoil, whether you are directly connected with the conflict or whether you uh, sub subscribe to some ideology or you are associated with a political party or something like that. Similarly, we have, um, I would like to mention one thing here that Madden in these novels, One by One, The Darkness and Hidden Symptoms, these are Catholic centric narratives. So unlike these two novels, The Resurrection Man by Ian McNam is a Protestant narrative, whereby we have this protagonist, Victor Kelly, he's a Protestant. Now, what actually draws him into the conflict is that his father is killed because he's uh, suspected to be a secret Catholic. So this completely changes him as a person. He becomes, he goes on a killing spree. He becomes a ruthless killer and he prowls uh, on these streets and he ends up killing so many people. So this is how things were uh, uh, back in 60s and how these writers have tried to fictionalize it and uh, try to show us what actually happens when we have an ethnic uh, conflict, a sectarian violence uh, in a particular state or in a particular country. So I'd like to conclude it now uh, by saying that conflict of any nature in anywhere has more or less the same consequences, right? And even though the troubles are over, we have agreements there, but we cannot say the troubles of people are over. Uh, absence of war does not mean peace. What matters is how people, uh, 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 what they think about the present, what they think about the future, what they think about other communities, uh, the communities that have wronged them, what are their attitudes, so what that matters, right? and the dramatic memories of all the people who have endured and who have experienced uh, all these uh, terrible experiences, these memories haunt people for generations, for ages to come. And any discriminatory attitude or prejudice against a community or a religious sect, it definitely escapes attentions. Uh, that's all from my end. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Hadia. It was a wonderful presentation. Just loved listening to how you projected uh, what the Irish community witnessed. So uh, we'll uh, take up some questions at the end. We, we hope you'll be with us till the end. So we can move over to the next speaker for today. Kavya, who's an MPhil scholar with Sri Ayappa College for Women, Tamil Nadu. And the topic on which she's going to present is intersectional feminist in motherhood. Kavya, are you here with us? Yes, ma'am, I'm here. Okay, so over to you, Kavya. Thank you, ma'am. Is it visible? No, we don't see any slides as yet. Is it visible, ma'am? Yes. But okay. yeah, yeah, okay. You can go ahead now. Thank you, ma'am. Good evening to all. I'm here to present the intersectional feminist of motherhood. So the paper presents the intersectional feminist in motherhood through the novel Little Earthquakes by Jennifer Vineyard. So Little Earthquakes brings who finds it more difficult in their life uh, during their first pregnancy the uh, analyzed study on this uh, study on this novel uh, brings out the first expression uh, ex uh, sorry experience of motherhood where the important feminism emerged from the western world feminism incorporates the position that society prioritizes the male position uh, male point of view where women are not treated the unhealthy standard uh, stand uh, standards in the gender equality where um, women are uh, getting troubled with mental issues and physical problems uh, jennifer wiener is an american writer television producer and journalist 
uh, her novel published in the year uh, little earthquake was published in the year 2005 uh, here are the three main characters uh, becky kelly and andy uh, yeah. uh, so although this is obvious that the perfect life may not be in cards for the cards uh, any of these women they learn that the love and forgiveness are far more important than perfection this is what jennifer vinier is trying to uh, uh, convey in a novel so uh, uh, intersectionality is the idea of interconnect uh, interconnected nature of social categorization such as race class and sexuality etc the concept the concept of women uh, uh, concept of uh, intersectionality is intended to illuminate the dynamic that have offended being overlooked by feminist theory and movement so the women are oppressed by the mental illness that have taken place in the past life circumstances the research topic on intersectionality feminism deals with the gender and race which affects the women in this society so, feminism emerged from the western western world focusing on the issue examined by the white middle class women and the privilege that practice uh, feminism through the boundaries that oppress feminist uh, so vinia brings out the main three char uh, characters uh, which points out the keywords of oppression self restraint subject uh, subjugation motherhood and sacrifice hello ma'am the overall issue that women in the society the thematical study on the intersectional feminism identify uh, identity identifies the women um, oppression on the gender based inequality the women are oppressed by women in this society where they are not accepted women subjugation in many ways where the male are dominant and women limits their boundaries so uh, let me go with the subjugation uh subjugation by women uh subjugation takes place in this novel and defines the character during their mother uh, motherhood and the women are treated like an object on rules and regulation women in society are used as an used as an object that can be used and thrown even women in the self determination of a woman the novel brings out the reality of a society that women oppression is not only by men even by women themselves in this feminist approach the women fights for women rights and freedom the women sensibility can be understood only by themselves women break down by their past struggles and expect their future to be better than before but the society which conflicts with the women should be in limited essentialist from a uh, form of thinking defines the feminist subjugative which discusses the um, mantle relate subjugative this context highlights the development of motherhood as a subjugative position in various historical and cultural specific ways feminist ideas of female empowerment and social injustice uh, that systematic inclusion study on the motherhood in women inaya uh, inaya is pointing out in little uh, little earth work that vinier wants to portray the power of a female as a wife in this era she shows that it is possible for women in this era to achieve the sacrifice and success on her own not uh, no mat no matter odds were against her here vinier explores the uh, explore the obstacles that lia becky and kelly counter in this uh, in their struggles and shows how they are able to solve their problems under the psychological pressure so women are ready to sacrifice their dreams so women uh, women's dreams in this world claims the journey of forgiveness and acceptance the journey of new motherhood research the different problems of past life these three characters have uh, different problems in life and uh, starting from a relationship uh, marriage uh, vinier points 
out the power of a female in the society to show the possible achievement sacrifice and success in her own life so here is a self control for uh, female uh, where she brings out as she brings out a uh, note about emotion and diet balance in their uh, motherhood time so the emotional lives of women who have encountered perform the uh, nutri uh, nutri sorry nutrating diet uh, maintenance during their uh, healthy uh, healthy growth for their baby eating more uh, over emotion which needs food habit control uh, here again uh, in a points uh, in a points about the physical appearance which is not attractive again so the overweight also uh brings a uh, uh so i would like to conclude um that intersectional feminism is the uh, is uh, is dealt with the gender and race which affects the women in the society they are not treated in the same way and this thesis study on feminism emerged from the western world focusing on the issues which is experienced by the white middle class women and the privilege that practices within uh, practices like from about feminist so women dream in this world claims the journey of forgiveness and acceptance and uh, the main three characters which goes through different problems and their relationship marriage wife pregnancy and having a baby that which shows a uh, vineyard points the power of female in the society which shows a possible way of achievement and sacrifice and success in her, in their life so here uh, john stuart uh, mel develops the idea of mel who argues the progress of women liberation he is uh, uh, finding a way to bring uh, essential happiness uh in the note the subjugation or uh, sorry subjugation of women which uh, he brings the effective half human race unable to contribute to the society so women practices in the act of weak emotion and traditional pre uh, prejudice uh, mill uh, mill attacks the marriage uh, he likens to the slavery of women that remains no legal slave save the mistress of every household so which identifies these three characters which are uh, women in the culture with her responsibility has to have their uh, has to come out of their uh, limitations and boundaries uh, i end up with a quote which uh, aristotle has uh, brought at the intersection where you gift talents and ability you will discover your purpose thank you thank you so much kavya thank you for your presentation a very important topic indeed we are all talking about gender equality these days and of course this is one aspect that we all need to look at and uh, contribute in our own ways okay so uh, i I'd, i'd like to quickly share my feedback and observation with all the speakers uh, dr ashwini do we have you here with us yes ma'am yeah ma'am uh, you you uh, brought to the fore the the years the uh, crucial years of emergency where the country witnessed an extreme political situation we saw corruption reaching new heights of course through the novel rich like us by nantara sagar so the, the the manner in which you shared details with us uh, uh, was wonderful the paper was very well written but th th there's just one thing which i would want you to comment on ma'am uh, what do you think of uh, uh, contemporary female writers uh, of uh, nantara sagar do you think their portrayal of women uh, is as uh, strong as that of uh, that are, are, are there other contemporary writers who uh, also focus on such situations uh, like she did in this novel are there educated uh, who... yes there are other political writers also yeah. like you have kushwan singh the female writers uh, like nantara uh, uh, okay her contemporaries if there are mm. any you could draw a parallel with 
well if you think of female writers i didn't find anyone as strongly you know criticizing and as strongly presenting the picture as she does okay as i said when i was you know right uh, just when i begin my paper i said that she is going to present an insider's view because since she is also a part and parcel Same of the family. family yeah true true so that was not uh, you know there for other writers yeah okay but then uh, even fictional characters have not been created to uh, the extent that she could okay so her women mm. are educated they are all educated do you think the the emergency situation exploited women more than it uh, exploited men of that time at that time uh yes some at some places like for example in the novel if i give an example from the rich like us itself if you look at nishi mm-hmm. nishi was exploited not just as a woman but you know as a uh, wife she was supposed to support her husband though he is wrong yeah so you know though she knows that i am wrong whatever is going on around me is wrong still as i said very religiously she stops herself from even commenting upon it mm-hmm. So right. yes so, so as a woman even today even today uh, uh, that situation is not there in the country anymore do you think we women still keep quiet at times and do not voice what uh, what we have in our minds uh, due to certain unspoken and unsaid pressures from the society or have of things course. changed <laughs> of course ma'am of course <laughs> situation this is, is still the same it's it's same madam it's same same yeah okay thank you ma'am thank you very much thank you wonderful wonderful presentation and uh, loved i've read this uh, novel years back but then loved uh, revisiting it again through your uh, paper thank you so much ma'am thank if, you ma'am if the, the house has any questions you're most welcome to uh, ask uh, dr ashwini anything that you have in mind do we have any questions all right thank you thank you so much ma'am thank you we we'll thank you my pleasure ma'am move on to uh, dr anita goswami and poonam sharma ma'am poonam ma'am are you, are you yes, there ma'am. with us uh, yes ma'am yes ma'am ma'am again a wonderful presentation yes we understand you had glitches and your laptop could not work but still you you did uh, share uh, in- insights on diaspora and did talk about some wonderful uh, Uh, writers like Usha Kishore and Uma Parameswar and Meena Alexander, Bharti Mukherjee. Uh, one of my research scholars is also working on uh, diasporic uh, writers, and uh, what you brought to the fore is, of course, central to all uh, diasporic mm-hmm. writers and literature, diasporic literature in general. So, ma'am, uh, uh, do you think these writers, the four writers you co- have covered, also bring in myth, Indian myths, to some extent? in in their uh, writings in their works uh, you talked about alienation you've talked about uh, up, uh, uprooting you've talked about how uh, trauma has been portrayed uh, and how uh, you know they they are uprooted from their own native land and it's basically some the, the situation is like that of a trishanku but do, do you also think these these writers that you've covered bring in uh, indian myths myths of the native land also in their uh, works uh, uh actually ma'am i have only uh, uh read the script uh, works of toru dutt she okay. has mentioned the indian myth in her uh, works mm-hmm. uh, like her in poem sita but uh, uh, meena uh, alexander uh, usha kishore uh, she had uh, just uh, uh, they wanted to present only the exploitation mm-hmm. of women uh, uh, in both the countries okay in their native land and in their foreign land where they are now living okay okay uh, they only present the suffering maybe uh, tarudat has tried to present indian myths in her works and poems mm-hmm. okay okay so here the theme is be- belongingness and alienation basically yes ma'am yes ma'am okay okay nice uh, presentation punam ma'am thank you so much and if you have any questions for uh, punam ma'am please you're most welcome to ask any questions all right thank you thank you so much ma'am thank you thank you ma'am we now move on to hadia hadia chishti do we have hadia here with us yes ma'am excellent presentation hadia uh, thank you um, again brought us closer to 
uh, another major landmark conflict that took place somewhere in Ireland. We, the world is witnessing another uh, upheaval. Uh, so how, how do you liken the two situations? There, of course, it was a, a religious, uh, you know, uh, basically it started with the conflict in the uh, two groups, uh, amongst two groups, the Catholics and Protestants. And of course, it took a political turn. Here, there's no political and uh, there's no religious religion involved, but still the situation is the same. So we know that literature is a true reflection of the society. And uh, the authors you quoted did talk about what uh, the people who suffered in Ireland witnessed. So what about uh, what, uh, what is happening now? Do you think uh, we'll have a lot of work uh, coming up on what the world is facing today between uh, Russia and uh, do, do you think uh, we'll have literature talk about what, what's happening today in the world? Yes, yes, obviously, because um, if we look at the if you look at history, like different countries have uh, experienced the civil wars, and people have recorded uh, these things. Even we have fictional and non-fictional narratives. So definitely, five years down the line, or ten years down the line, or even maybe next year, people might have already started writing about it. It's obviously the motive is to kind of to make people aware. You know, war of any nature is has a disastrous consequence because it kind of impacts you. It impacts the whole society. So definitely people would be talking about, people are talking about it. People would be fictionalizing the incidents that are actually happening right now. Again, for our society, for future readers, like what it does to society. Uh, yeah. So are, like they, are, said, are, are the works of the writers you chose biographic in nature to some extent? To some extent, yes. To some extent, they are biographical in nature because like I said that we have some... Uh, Catholic centric uh, views and Protestant centric views. And uh, uh, two of uh, the, like Deirdre Madden, she's an Irish uh, writer. So she, uh, the, we can say that her works, we have an element of biographical element in her works. Or the other author that I talked about, Patrick Redden Keefe, he is not Irish, but he's American, but he's a journalist. So his work uh, is a journalist study. So yes, people are talking about everything, like be it facts or fictionalizing things. So we can say yes, uh, definitely it's again for us, for our, uh, for the readers to see what war does to a society. Because again, now if we talk about uh, the Ukraine crisis, how people are fleeing uh, uh, the Ukraine, what would be the problems that we'll face in your future? So mm -hmm. I think in all the situations, in all the case studies, uh, uh, wherever we have the ethnic crisis, uh, be it uh, in Middle East or if we talk about um, uh, be it Syria or whatever, different countries that we had. Uh, so the consequences, experiences are same. So yes, people would write about it. People would talk about it. And there definitely would be debates and discussions mm -hmm. uh, talking about the conflict. So yes. Okay. And the peace walls that were built, uh, some of them are still there? Yes, yes. And, and how, how, how do you relate these peace walls with the Berlin Wall? Of course, there was a, there's another wall that uh, history talks about, right? which was demolished years later. Do you know about it? The Berlin Wall between I'm East and West Germany? I'm not acquainted with so, it. Okay, I, I would recommend you read about the Berlin Wall. You may, may like to, uh, you know, draw a, a parallel and, you know, I don't know. Are you taking it up as your uh, PhD uh, research work? Yes, yes. I'm working on Irish troubles. Yes. Okay. So you may like to draw a comparison because of course the reasons are different, but then what, how people suffer on both sides is what you could actually uh, relate uh, to. All right. Thank you so much, Adia. Wonderful listening thank, to you. It thank you quite for your feedback. Yeah. And how? Uh, uh, what got you interested in Irish? Uh, the 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 conflict, the trouble. Uh, uh, it was uh, actually Irish. Uh, not only the Irish troubles, Irish literature. Uh, while I was during during my masters, I was introduced to Irish troubles. Okay. We had a uh, Seamus uh, Heaney in our syllabus. So uh, I guess it all started from that because uh, conflict is something which is everywhere uh, in the world. Yeah. So I wanted to delve deep into this field, particularly the ethnic conflict. So I guess, and even Anna Byrne, she won Booker Prize in 2018. So I thought people are still, writers are still talking about it. We need to talk about it more. So yeah. It's wonderful, wonderful, Habia. Quite, quite Thank refreshing you. too. You know, otherwise we usually get to listen to, uh, you know, uh, concepts that we uh, hear over and over again in conferences, but yours was quite different and quite interesting. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And uh, Kavya, 
Uh, are you here with us? Yes, ma'am. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, do we have any questions for Hadia? If there are any, please go ahead. Any questions from the house for Hadia? All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Kavya, uh, your topic is, of course, very interesting, as I've mentioned before, intersectional feminist, uh, feminism. Uh, it all started in 1989 when the fourth wave of feminism started. You, you did uh, mention the problems uh, that uh, the world, women all over the world face because of intersectionality. And uh, I would recommend you read more about all the four waves of feminism. You're still an empty student. So, of course, I don't know whether you'll be taking up research in this field or, uh, uh, but then even for, for your general interest, you must read about all four waves. Now, once more, a sim simple question for you. How do you think we women can help uh, each other in uplifting uh, those who are marginalized? Would you like to uh, share your views on it? Ma'am, your voice is breaking. Can you tell it again? How can we women help uplift other women who are marginalized? Mm, we shouldn't uh, stick on to the terms of culture and tradition. They, sh uh, they shouldn't be sticking on, uh, sticking on to that. Uh, once if they stop, they will know uh, their desire. Come out. Okay. Okay. So at least uh, not suppress other women and, of course, uh, do a little bit of hand-holding and not stick to norms laid down by the society. And, uh... yes, okay, okay. Thank you, Kavya. Thank you Thank for you. your uh, presentation. I hope, hope you uh, get to read more and work more on. Sure, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you so much. So that brings us... Uh, any questions for Kavya? So we come to the end of today's session. I would like to take this opportunity once again to thank uh, the English Department of Sri Ramakrishna College of Arts and Science for Women and also the Cape Comoran Trust. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity uh, to uh, share this platform with such wonderful presenters. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed listening to all the speakers today. Thank you, organizers. Over to you. Do we have another Thank session? You, another session after this, or we end? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. We have another session. Okay. okay. Thank you so much.